This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. The Undead and the Medieval Period are, from a narrative perspective, a match made in heaven. Or should I say, in purgatory? The Middle Ages were both a time of incredible inventions, architecture and progress, but also a time of war, death and a fascination for the occult, both within the educated elite, the clergy and the common people. So no wonder that we have these two concepts, the Middle Ages and the Undead, in many fantasy settings. But did medieval people actually believe in this sort of creatures and if so, uh, what did they look like and what sort of stories did they tell? And when we talk about medieval Europe as a whole, uh, was there a sort of regional variation in the way these ghosts were represented in folklore and myths? And last but not least, if we were to show our ghosts from our games, films, movies and novels to a real medieval person, would they even recognize it as a ghost? Welcome to the first episode of Historically Accurate Medieval Undead. Whenever we try to understand how something was perceived and understood in period, we have to approach the subject from an unfiltered perspective. The words ghost, poltergeist, spectre, phantom may have a specific meaning in our culture in our day and age, but the same words may not even have existed, or if they did, they could have a different semantic meaning to them uh, for people of the period. In other words, terms come with a certain level of cultural semantic baggage. Ghost stories did exist in the medieval period, but not only some of these may appear a little bizarre and not really match with our expectations, it's also important to say that the concept of a ghost story of an apparition does not originate in the Middle Ages. In fact, these were rather common in both the Greco and Roman world. However, in early medieval Europe, what changes is the perception of ghost stories, whether they be new or old. In other words, a certain number of clerical figures rejected the idea that the dead could return in soul form to the earth after death. Look at, for example, Tertullian, Lactantius, who dismissed ghost stories and considered them vulgar superstition. And still talking about early church fathers preceding the Middle Ages, already Augustine of Hippo allowed only for the image of a dead person to return and for clarity as opposed to the actual spirit or soul of the deceased and oftentimes this was a deed of either an angel or a demon. And even more specifically, in early church teachings, the idea was that if you were to encounter an apparition there was a high chance not only that it would have been created by a demon or an angel but that you were actually running into an angel or a demon directly. Just like many other things, this all approach or understanding of what um, supernatural experiences could mean or signify changes and evolves through the centuries as many different thinkers and church authorities start to approach the matter in a more systematic way, shall we say. But how do we get from the sort of early scepticism of medieval church authorities to a well-established tradition of ghosts and apparitions in, say, Shakespearean times, for example, the apparition of the Danish ghost? So, we have already established that the belief of ghosts existed already in antiquity in Europe. And in the Middle Ages, the early church discussions on ghosts cemented mostly on the idea that they were coming from the pagan world. However, in the 9th century, that's when the church agrees to embrace a new liturgy of the dead. Ghost stories start to appear all over the place, particularly in monasteries and they oftentimes exhibit a specific teaching function. We'll get to that in a minute. Suffice to say that because of this huge change of approach of church authorities, the belief in ghosts and apparitions begins to grow tremendously among the people. But as we explore medieval literature, both secular and religious, what do we see about these medieval ghosts? What's their appearance, their functions, their actions? It is undeniable that the early approach of the medieval period when it comes to ghosts is strongly influenced by the Christian perspective on the matter. Narratives about ghosts are written in Latin and vernacular, are meant for the clergy and the laity. And even though this fixation with the paranormal, with the ghostly, starts to be criticized by some authors in the church, there is one specific monastic order that will play a pivotal role when it comes to the connection between the clergy and the people, the Cistercians. 
and they will become, as a monastic order, one of the main elements within the public discussion of ghosts. The narrative connected with the mendicant orders, whom had to constantly interact with many references of appearances and paranormal phenomena, will, for example, connect the idea of ghosts to cemeteries, for obvious reasons. This is where we can start to explore one of the primary functions of ghosts within medieval tales and literature, that of deductive function. In other words, there are some of these ghost stories that have some form of message or something that you need to learn from, a deductive aspect for both the person who is experiencing this sort of apparition and the people that hear about it. Another function of ghosts within these medieval stories was to warn the living of their misdeeds. In other words, the experience of the ghost who was already deceased and went beyond the veil is advantageous to the living, the ghost that has gone through it, the ghost has made the mistakes and now he wants to warn the people. This is probably one of the main differences between the way we interpret ghost stories in our day and age, which are mostly meant to entertain, scare, and ghost stories in the medieval period whereby sometimes they were used to teach and oftentimes had a spiritual intellectual condition to them. As we observe, the collective imagination involving ghosts in medieval times could be considered somewhat different than ours. An interesting way to approach all of this and gauge the difference between now and then is to examine medieval literature in the fascinating inquiry of the impact the dead have on the living. In other words, we are talking about the role of the supernatural in medieval context. A comprehensive analysis of medieval literature regarding ghosts and apparitions also revealed a secondary function, that is, that of temptation, and of course in this case we are talking about negative, demonic, evil ghosts, whose role was to lead the person that was encountering the apparition to apostasy. It is, however, important to understand that considering the huge variety – French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, English, Scandinavian – ghost stories will not all be the same. Therefore, we are always present to an array of different elements of supernatural entities. Now, of course, all of this can be fascinating, intriguing and even a little scary, but you shouldn't be only scared of ghosts, apparitions and poltergeists. You should also be prepared towards other types of attacks, aka cyber attacks. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the Data Breach Monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machine, so that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice, but also because it's really affordable, and that links to today's special offer. Get the price cut. That's $1.70 a month for three years plus six months for free. So if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.70 a month for three years plus six months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer, so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. Now, one curious device that is used within the supernatural genre of medieval literature is shape shifting. From a literary standpoint, the ability to shape shift is easily identified as when a character has the ability to transform into something else or someone else. In some instances within the literature we do see that ghosts do seem to have this ability, which is probably one of the main differences with the sort of imagination we have attached to the concept of ghosts in our day and age. Shapeshifting is present in fantasy games, stories and novels, but not necessarily connected to ghosts that often. 
So as you start exploring the cultural belief in the supernatural, over 1000 years of Middle Ages you'll notice a massive change over time, the significance of the apparition and in general a veritable cornucopia of ideas and approaches. And that is because when we talk about medieval Europe as a whole, we are literally creating a sort of amalgamation of cultures, languages and backgrounds, which at the time of the medieval period, specifically in the early Middle Ages, weren't that far away from previous religious and spiritual approaches, which in the medieval period were considered to be pagan or heathen. And even though there are scholars that bring forth the idea that already by the 10th century the majority of pagan religions were completely dismembered and fully replaced by Christendom, it, there are also scholars that do believe that in fact some of these beliefs, perhaps in secrecy, were still held by the people. Therefore, even from a religious standpoint, the idea of a ghost, what it would do, how it would appear and how it would function would be a mix between the old religion and the new religion. One of the predominant discourses within religious approaches to the concept of ghosts is the idea of discerning where a ghost comes from. In other words, is it a good apparition coming from God or is it a bad apparition coming from the devil? Was a person possessed by the Holy Spirit or by a devil's minion? We will find all sorts of clerics trying to find a way to recognize the apparition of the diabolical as opposed to the possession of the Holy Spirit. But the way this was approached is not necessarily 100% religious. Stay with me. Even though from a biblical standpoint we only have two mentions of possible interactions with ghosts which are not even definite and will be interpreted differently, from a medieval perspective the practice of trying to understand whether a ghost was coming from the devil or from God, particularly when concerning women, had in its basis an epistemological inquiry which would be approached by thinkers of the time as empirical proof of the divine character of the apparitions or lack thereof. In other words, if we were to look at this from a modern perspective we could say that the uh, concept of the crux of trying to understand where a spirit is coming from uh, from a medieval perspective even when analyzing other people's tales or stories was a sort of early form of medieval spiritual forensics. So from the perspective of a medieval person the debate of the correlation between the natural and the supernatural was not diametrically opposed. In fact, supernatural was not even a term used at the time. Now that we have created a little bit of the context of the time and we have a better understanding of how things were perceived by the people, I think it would be great to talk about some of these ghost stories. For example, have you ever heard of the Byland Abbey? There are several medieval manuscripts connected to the Abbey, dating to the Middle Ages, among which we have a collection of 12 ghost stories. The manuscript is now found in London, British Library. The stories would be mostly set locally and were intended to be included during sermons as a form of exemplar, so with a didactic role. Now, if you want to know more about these specific stories, I would suggest a beautiful blog written by Eleanor Jackson. We'll read a little bit from it, you'll find a link in the description. The stories, 12 in total, were written in the early 15th century on the blank pages of a manuscript containing a collection of rhetorical and theological works. Despite being written in Latin, the language of the church, the stories are mostly set among the rural communities of North Yorkshire. The ghosts in the Byland stories are not the evil forces which seek to harm humanity in many modern horror tales. They are mostly people from the community who have died without confessing sins, righting wrongs or otherwise preparing for a good death. The ghosts cannot get to heaven until their issues have been resolved, so they rise from their graves to seek help from the living. The sins in questions tend to be relatively mundane. Story 9 tells us of a ghost whose crime is a matter of sixpence. In Story 6, the ghost of a canon of New Bern Priory is tormented for stealing silver spoons. In Story 7, a hired hand is punished for overindulging his oxen, feeding them on his master's comb and letting them plough the land too shallowly. 
the ghosts try a variety of tactics for persuading people to help. So as you can see this idea that sometimes we see even in role playing games where the ghost is dead but he hasn't finished, he has an unfinished business and so he asks the person, the player in this case, uh, to help them so that they can be put to rest is already found in the medieval period and probably was quite common. One of the things that this author points out in this blog is the fact that if you keep on reading these stories you'll notice that there is an interesting characteristic when it comes to the actual appearances of these ghosts, at least in these stories. If you look at story 3 for example, the ghost doesn't speak from his vocal cords but speaks from his bowels which are empty and function as a form of casket if you will, whereas in story 5 we see a woman who is carrying a ghost on top of her shoulders. What this gives us is probably one of the main differences between how ghosts are perceived today and ghosts were perceived in the medieval period, namely the fact that sometimes ghosts are not ethereal, they are bodily and they are physical. This of course is not always the time, we do have apparitions of ghosts that are instead made of a sort of spiritual matter if you will and, and are therefore more of an evanescent form, but ghosts that are more like living corpses do appear. Personally, when it comes to this specific collection of stories, my favourite is the one involving a ghost horse. Elder Scrolls, anyone? In this story, you have this uh, wanderer who runs into a ghostly apparition of a horse. As he tries to scare the horse away, the spirit of the horse starts to stalk him and at one point even transforms, hence connecting back to the idea of shape shifting, into a ball of light. In general, with these stories specifically, we often have this uh, idea that as you're being attacked or oppressed by a ghost, you need to call in the name of the Lord so that then the ghost will be rebuked. And then usually ghosts, these ghosts tell you why they're doing what they're doing, what sort of help they need. But of course it shouldn't surprise us that the story written specifically by monastic orders were in fact intended to reinforce your Christian beliefs. Still, not all ghost stories had this sort of didactic function and there are definitely stories that were instead intended to simply scare their listeners as much as you would think in our day and age. All in all, whether they be connected with more ancient folklore or whether they be born with the new Christian approach to the supernatural, ghost stories were absolutely plentiful in the medieval period. In fact, in conclusion, one could say that through these exemplar that we see throughout the entirety of medieval history and literature, even though many things have changed and the details will be different, perhaps we could see the overall idea of the ghost, the phantom of the dead, still remaining in the world as a form of connection between what some people believe today and what our ancestors did in the medieval time. All right, noble ones, but let me know if you like this pilot episode of this series. If you did, I'll make much more detailed and deep episodes. Perhaps we could talk about skeletons or whether people believed in vampires or what zombies and living dead actually were believed to do or be still in the medieval period. Of course, as always, if you like this video, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet a member of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to click the link in the description to take advantage of the amazing offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.